est perdu, la Venise à Barcelone. Donc, j'ai des vêtements que vous voyez là. Il faut imaginer, s'il vous plaît, cravate, costume, tout correct. Hein? Bon, on passe, on passe à l'espoir. Oh, we're going to hope. Do you remember the election of Obama? Recently after the election of Obama in the United States, we had a list of problems that can be solved. And one of those problems was the language problem with machine translation, 2019. Okay, yes, we can, said Obama. And he had more reason to do it than they did back in the days of the Georgetown experiments when it was for five or six years. We can't. No, statistical machine translation enabled one to believe there was a virtuous curve. The more you did it, the better it got. The better it got, the more people did it, and this would set us up to heaven and solve the problem, right? Okay, so yes, we can, into Spanish, as you can see, Google Translate. I did this yesterday, okay? Si podemos, no problems. Take si podemos, back translate it in Google Translate. Yeah, if we can. I've been using this example for years now, and it's still there. <laughs> okay, so, yes, we can, perhaps, there's an if there. And it's important to figure out what these conditionals are. So what I want to do here, quite briefly, I don't want to cover the same ground as what's been presented, so I'll go very quickly through the example part. I want to get to right and wrong questions to ask about machine translation and about its policy implications for communication. Okay, so first example, you can see that um, with rule-based translation it was a mess. This is our conference program here today. Uh, particularly a mess uh, because it couldn't handle selbstverständlich. Doesn't know how to pass it. Doesn't know if it's an adjective or an adverbial function here. Okay, but uh, Google Translate now, look at that beautiful translation. Will it be natural? That is really, really good. I mean, we have made great progress. There are still things you might want to do. Post-editing, that is the correction of mainstream translation, can still be used for these stylistic things and this language cultural for Schwachkulturelle. Uh, you might want to fix it up in English. It could be made better for 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 high-risk communication or for uh, promotional publication, you would want to revise that text, but the progress is enormous and we can't ignore it. I also note, this is important for the end of my talk, that the technologies allow the user to peruse alternative translations. Okay, if you're not happy with natural, take a look at the other ones that are there and there might be something there you could use. Uh, my real question is, do the technologies allow people to do that, or are the technologies being promoted and used in a way where people think, ah, that is the translation, article, singular, rather than using the technology to explore the diversity and creativity of languages. Right and wrong questions. <coughs> Translators will tell me, especially translators of my age, I can translate better than any machine, so why bother about the machine? Well, number one, the machine is not translating. The statistical technologies are looking through databases for previous human translations. It's all human. It's just a question of finding the right bit of humanity that has done the translation. And this is why neural can work. If the search engines are more subtle and more exact, they can locate that little bit of prior human work that can be reused. Machines are not translating, they are finding human translations. The real question is then whether it's more efficient for professionals to uh, translate from scratch or to post edit, to take a machine translation and repair it. Uh, studies that were done a few years ago, especially by a colleague in Sydney, who did two fairly big experiments on this, showed that it's not 
really clear, at that stage it wasn't really clear, uh, that there were many advantages with respect to time. Uh, we found that people didn't go that much faster. But there were real advantages with respect to terminology. That is, the machine picks up field-specific terminology far better than translators who really can't be experts in all the fields they have to work into. And the other finding in those experiments, this is by Ignacio Garcia, University of Western Sydney, the other finding was that the users with weaker language skills in the target language were helped better. They got the most benefit out of machine translation. That it's not really there to make professional translators perform better, because they're already at high level. But it's going to be a real help to all those people who are non-professional translators or who collaborate freely in translation projects, who are not trained in translation, but are going to use these technologies to help them to do it better. Uh, this increases the number of translations that circulate in our societies, and that can be a laudable fact if and when people do not take those translations at face value as the translation. False question number two. They're not questions, are they? They're statements. You've seen, I think, some of the recent research. It's 2018. There have been papers by Microsoft on uh, Chinese English news translation and uh, the other one by Google. And both are claiming to different degrees and on different, uh, on basis of different experiments, both are claiming to have reached a kind of parity, as we just saw. And the basis of that claim is users can't tell the difference. That is, you give users of the translation different sentences that are translated, and they have to say which they prefer or which they think the machine did. Okay? And it's true. Statistically, that's fine. Because people make mistakes, and machines make mistakes, and people can't tell what the difference is. Okay? Does that mean that we have parity? with professional translators. Not at all. You've got to think about it. People don't translate sentences. They translate texts. People don't read sentences, although they do if they're on a computer with a find function, but normally we produce texts, and users are going through a text with linearity and narrativity and all these pragmatic discursive features. One of the features of text is that some parts are really important and other parts are not. You're reading a text for that bit of information you need. There's high-risk parts and low-risk parts. Now, machine translation can't tell the difference. They're all sentences being processed. A human translator, especially the more professional they become, and we found this empirically, human translators go really fast when it doesn't matter, the background stuff, the reference stuff, the, you know. And then when there's a problem that is important, that is high risk for the social function of the text, they spend more time on it. Novices don't. Novices have more uniform time distribution. Professionals break it up. What does this mean? If you've got a page and you know there are two mistakes in it, the professional translator will have worked on those will know that those mistakes are not in the high-risk areas because they've worked on them. If there are two mistakes in the machine translation, it could be in the high-risk or low-risk area. So there's an inherent risk in only doing machine translation, in not having it checked by professional translators. That's the logic, and that's why claims of parity based on isolated sentences are fundamentally not valid. That I, if that doesn't make sense, I'm happy to explain more about it. Okay. <laughs> question number three. Should be a question. This is a citation or it is. Eric Pickles, who was a, what was he, a Minister for Community Affairs in uh, the Government of England, not of the United Kingdom, of England. Here he is. If you give people translations, they won't learn English. So the, the argument here really concerns not only machine translation, but translation services in general. 
And my mum thinks this is right. She says, yeah, why should we make them work? And the, make them work. If you give them free language services, they won't learn the language. And you can see his arguments there. And, and it continues there, you know, the savings one, the economic one, uh, is the one that he was most interested in at that stage. Now, in a project that I've been working on, and I'll mention it later, MIME, Mobility and Inclusion in Multilingual Europe, we have been carrying out studies on various people, on the mobility of teachers, mobility of students, on asylum seekers in Leipzig and in Ljubljana, on Russian speakers in Catalonia, on international adoption processes, all these individual case studies, and we look at the what we call mediation strategies that they use. Now, in all those studies, people use machine translation. They're going to use it, but in a very transitory way. And in no case, in none of our studies, have we found any occurrence where the provision of translation services or the use of machine translation stops language learning. People who are undergo mobility, except for very short-term cases, are given to language learning and many of them know how to use the machines to use this in order to increase their language skills. So we found firm evidence for a very complementary relationship between all the, the mediation strategies and especially between machine translation and language learning. It's just it's a simple kind of analysis. Uh, we've got the various benefits of each strategy and you can see that the machine translation here lost because there are other technologies available. Uh, it's used for short one-off things, its cost is low, it gives the user independence, you don't have to wait for an interpreter to come up or wait for a translation to be done. Accuracy may not be high and inclusion, social inclusion may not be high, but there are other things you can do for those values. So typically, if we have an asylum seeker uh, going for a visit to the doctor, they will use machine translation to prepare their visit so they will know if they're speaking Pashto or Arabic, they'll get the German terms for what they're going to explain and go in and check what the doctor is saying against what they've checked beforehand. That is, they'll do their bit of language learning so they can control, not control, they can be relatively empowered in the use of German or English, as only with Franca, with, with the medical stuff. That, that's a very typical use of machine translation to assist in language learning and to play a complementary role with respect to all these other mediation strategies. Singularity, this moment of parity, which was claimed by Google and Microsoft in 2018, goes back to quite an old idea by Ray Kurzweil, 2005, when we get to the point where the capacity of machine intelligence equals that of human intellect. And this is called the singularity, which you have probably heard of. The literature somehow pushes the moment of singularity further and further into the future as we get to it, but the idea is still rife. Now, does this apply to what we're seeing in machine translation? As it would seem to, given the claims of, of parity. Well, yes, in terms of capacity. Yes, we can, in terms of computer processing capacity. But no, we can't, because, as I said, the translations are done by humans, and people are stupid. <laughs> now, for any kind of machine translation to work, you need a database, and if that database has rubbish in it, you get into the old paradigm of rubbish in, rubbish out. <laughs> the bet of statistical methods, and this is why it really leapt off, uh, leapt ahead uh, in the 1990s, was that the bigger the database, the mathematics of probability will edit the rubbish out. What they found, though, and what we have found since, is that people are so stupid, they believe the translation is the translation, put it on a website, 
the crawler gets to the website, picks up the parallel text, puts it back in the database, and you've got, instead of that virtuous circle going to paradise, you get a decline in some languages, or at least not changing, in where uh, rubbish out, rubbish in, rubbish out, rubbish and it all goes down the toilet. <laughs> a vicious circle instead of a virtuous circle. Now, Neural comes in to 2016 and tries to break that. I mean, Google and Microsoft tried to break it first by not or by making people pay to have their machine translation feed into the um, um, uh, translation memory programs that people use. But that's technical. I won't go into it too much. What Neural does, and it's really intriguing, if there's some matches that come up and they have a very low probability, and it sort of doesn't connect, they omit. I don't know if you've picked it up, but there is strategic omission of little details. That sort of the too hard basket is not going to make sense. It's just high. Translators have been doing this for, for centuries, and we haven't told anybody about it. Uh, beware, your machine translation is doing that. Trying to hide those things, that stupid things that people have put in the database. Okay, uh, and, and doing a pretty good job, but watch out for the omissions. That's why singularity hasn't and won't change anything unless people get smarter about the use of technologies. That's the work we have to do. Technicians are doing great work. Mathematicians are doing great work on the technologies. Not linguists anymore, they're mathematicians. Our work as trainers, and as people in this kind of event, is to educate users about what machines can do and what they can't do. So, now for some answers. Will we be able to replace all human translators? No. No, because the databases have to be kept clean somehow. No, because high-risk situations need trust, and trust is in humans still. Even if, even if the role of translators is simply there to check it and authorize it, that is a valid and necessary social function. Establishing trust is incredible. This is why I should have my time. <laughs> I trust people. <laughs> okay, and there are obvious policy implications. I suggest, okay, that our teaching, our teaching of foreign languages, has to talk about what machine translation does. Why? All the students are using it anyway. So you might as well use it in class and show what it can do and what it can't do and how you can use it as a learning tool. Uh, and all the more so for the training of translators. But I think all additional language education has to include work on MT. It also means that when we train translators, we have to focus on them doing the things that the machine translation cannot do. That is inspiring confidence, cleaning up text, making it very presentable. And the big thing for policy implications is the work on smaller languages. Uh, I, I speak Catalan, I like it very much. Uh, Catalan is in there in the list. The machine translation into and from Catalan is not too bad. But for the big international systems, it goes through Spanish. As many other, yes, five, okay, good, we're almost there. Uh, as is the case for many smaller languages being fed through English, which means that the, the lingua francas are playing a dominant filtering role within the machines. You can't see it happening, uh, but it's there. Should machine translation be used when providing public services? Absolutely not in high-risk situations, or any situation where there's no human post-editing. But yes, it should be encouraged when it's user-initiated, and it gives the user of public services more confidence, trust, and capacity to learn. Okay, so it's a risk-based analysis that has to be done on the services that are being provided. Uh, best ways of working with machine translation, uh, except that it can include uh, enhance efficiency with neural, especially now, and especially terminological accuracy. It has its advantages and role to play. Pre-editing is a real option. 
Pre-editing is when you, you uh, have a, a start text to work on and you remove the things that you know are going to be difficult in machine translation. That is, if it's in English, you write it in basic English. Uh, get rid of passives, for example. Get rid of subordination. Pre-editing. If the translation is then going to go into, let's say, more than three languages, we're finding it's more efficient to pre-edit than to post-edit. Okay, but there are simple experiments you can do and find out when, for your operation, it's better to pre-edit or post-edit. So pre-editing skills, that is technical writing skills, are things that we have to train people on as well for the start languages, for the languages we're producing documents in. Final question. I want people to use the technologies and enjoy them. Make it fun. And I think one of the problems of what we've got out there is that they are just giving one translation. I would love to have something where you pass the cursor over and we get alternative translations popping up, or in the future eye tracking and you pause there and it pops up because you alternative explanations. So that we know that machine translation is good, aber das ist nicht immer selbstverständlich. Vielen Dank.